morning, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings, for your goodness and kindness. We thank you for your wonderful salvation, for the cross and the death of your Son, for his blood that cleanses from all sin. We thank you, Lord God, for the eternal truth of your word and your spirit that leads us into all truth. Be with us this morning and this evening, and also with the children, Father. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. For this morning, please, turn with me, first of all, to the book of Revelation. Revelation, chapter 4, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne, and he was sitting was like jasper stone, and the sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne proceed flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And in the center around the throne four living creatures filled with eyes in front and on back. And so we have the seven spirits of God as it's put. And we see the appearance of the rainbow. The rainbow in verse 3. This of course resembles Ezekiel chapter 1, where the spirit of God is and they move the four creatures follow the spirit. Same as Ezekiel chapter 1. There's nothing in the book of Revelation that's not somewhere else in Scripture. To understand the book of Revelation, you just have to understand the rest of the Bible first, then it all adds up. But so it goes. The seven spirits of God. We see the rainbow. With this in view, before we look further in Revelation, turn with me please to the book of Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. After the flood... God tells Noah, verse 11, I will establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never be cut off by water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. Of course, we know in Peter's epistle, it says it will be destroyed by fire. It talks about Noah, but then it says it will be destroyed with fire. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you, and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I will set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. And it will come about when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all the flesh of the earth. The rainbow is the sign of the covenant. The rainbow is the sign of the covenant. And we know the only thing that a rainbow is is an atmospheric refraction of the prism. Because of the rain, there you have the rainbow. You have the rainbow. When you go to do A-levels in physics, they will tell you there's no such thing as color as we think of color. This handkerchief is not white. It is simply reflecting all the colors of the spectrum. Or something like a black suit is not black. It is simply reflecting none of the colors of the spectrum. Or they will tell you that this communion wine is not really red. It is simply reflecting that color and so forth. And you know, the dyes in the paint or something like this. It's not really orange. It's just reflecting a combination of colors from the spectrum that make it appear to be orange. Nothing has any color in itself. It only has a chemical constituency that reflects colors that are in the atmosphere from the prism. Well, you can do things with the spectrograph. A physicist, of course, they can shine light into a triangular prism, and he can produce the seven colors of the spectrum. He can do it. Stand at the right angle from the sun with a garden hose and spray it, and you'll get a mist, and you'll see prism. People can make a prism. People can make a prism to produce visible spectrum. You can make a spectrum. You can even make an aqua spectrum with water. You can do that 
But only God can make a rainbow. Only God can make a rainbow. The rainbow has to come down from the sky. It's not something people can put up. It's something that only God can bring down. And so we read about this in the book of Revelation, the seven spirits of God correspond to the seven colors, as we would call them, in the rainbow. Once again, the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, we have the seven spirits of God before the throne. So too we see in Revelation chapter 3 verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis writes, He who has the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits of God. Once again, Revelation chapter 4 verse 5, there it is again. And from the throne proceed flashes of light and sounds and peals of thunder, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Finally, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, we read the following. And I saw between the throne were the four living creatures, same as Ezekiel 1, and the elders a, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Of course, we know from the book of Revelation, the Antichrist will attempt to counterfeit this with his seven horns. But we see here, once more, the seven spirits of God. There has been a lot of speculation as to what this is. There are some people who have wrongly said there are seven Holy Spirits. Some people have actually said that. Once Benny Hinn, the American televangelist, I'm only saying what he said on television, said there was nine persons in the Trinity. <laughs> you got the Father, the Son, you got the... He actually said that. He actually said that on television. Then there were people called Branhamites who followed somebody called William Branham in the early part of the 20th century. They had some very peculiar beliefs. He said the seven spirits were seven anointed figures throughout church history. The Apostle Paul being one, St. Columba being another, someone called Martin of Tours being another, Martin Luther being another. John Wesley being another, and of course, William Brannan being the last. <laughs> and, you know, you see the, the Kansas City prophets and stuff like that. This all comes from, from Brannan. This it all began with him. That's where this stuff comes from, the Brannanites. Then there are those who say they are seven angels, seven angelic beings. That is also a mistake. It cannot possibly be, because we see from the seven spirits of God, and from he who is on the throne comes grace and truth in Revelation chapter 1. Paul tells us repeatedly in his epistles, They cannot be angels. Grace and peace do not come from angels. Grace and peace only come from Jesus. What then is the meaning of seven spirits? Seven spirits which obviously correspond to the rainbow, to the seven colors. What is it? Well, the Greek word is hep. Hepta. Hepta. Forget seven. However, it can be co-equally and quite correctly translated sevenfold. Sevenfold. One with the seven eyes. Seven lights in the lampstand. It's one lampstand, but seven different lights. It's a sevenfold light in one lamp. The Spirit of God is one person. We find the meaning of this in Isaiah chapter 11 the 11th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. We have a prophecy about the Messiah in verse 1. A shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. This is the shortish Eshai prophecy about Jesus. And it goes on, and a branch from the roots will bear fruit. That is the fruit of the Spirit, of course. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and strength the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. You've got the spirit himself, and then these six manifestations. That's being wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and fear of the Lord. The Septuagint is a little bit different. The Septuagint has godliness, so the Septuagint has the Holy Spirit, but then it has these seven manifestations. 
These manifestations should not be confused with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the divine nature, the divine attributes manifested in Christ, that by the Holy Spirit is manifested in us. And there are nine of those. It's not the fruit of the Spirit, not the divine nature. Neither is it the gifts of the Spirit. Neither is it the gifts of the Spirit. These are manifestations of the Spirit. The best way to put it is the Greek word energamai, energamai, the energy. The energy of the Holy Spirit, yeah, the energizing of the Holy Spirit is manifested in these seven ways. With wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, fear of the Lord, and in the Septuagint, godliness. These are the seven spirits of God, which were all incorporated and reflected in Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2. But let's continue looking at this. Only God can make a rainbow. A rainbow requires rain. He says, when I see the cloud, Jesus is coming in the clouds. Hebrews tells us about clouds of witnesses. Only God can bring the rainbow. Only God can bring the rain. We've explained many times how this works. Isaiah also tells us how it works. Once more, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. The Holy Spirit outpoured. God makes it rain, and when it really rains, there's a rainbow. Only God can pour out His Spirit. It's nothing people can make happen. We see this in the saga of Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi. The priests of Baal, with their pagan antics, tried to make it rain. But they could not do it. Pagan religion... False religion could never make the Holy Spirit manifest. Only Elijah could do that. False religion will always try to produce a counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. There's a reason New Agers represent their belief system with what? A rainbow. In my teenage years, there was a very popular rock band called Pink Floyd on the cover of their album, Dark Side of the Moon, it had this, this whole, the, the New Age symbol with the rainbow, com the, the prism coming out. New Agers always try to have this rainbow up at their Mecca for this country. Their Mecca is in Finhorn in Scotland, and they got their rainbow. Everywhere you go where you see New Age, you see a rainbow. They've always got it on their posters, they have it on their adverts, they have it in, it's in their symbol, it's the rainbow. They're always trying to make it happen. But only God can make the rainbow happen. Only God can really send the rain. The priests of Baal cannot do it. Only Elijah could do it. Only God could send it. They can't really make it happen. But try and try, they will. The same as the spirit of Jesus. There's a counterfeit. The spirit of Antichrist. I've warned many times, the same as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, even as we speak. The spirit of Antichrist is preparing the apostate church for the coming of the Antichrist. Do you hear what I said? As we speak right now, the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ. There are other churches having services right now in this city, Catholic and Protestant, where the spirit of Antichrist is preparing those churches for the coming of the Antichrist. They always have to try to have a rainbow. They try to have to hack it, make it happen. But they can't do it. Only God can do it. Only He can send the rainbow. You can have the mist, you can have the spray with the garden hose stand at the right angle, you can see the spectrum, but you can't put it in the sky. It must come down from the throne of God. It must come down from Revelation chapter 4. If it doesn't come down from Revelation chapter 4, if it doesn't come from the Shemaim, from the sky, it's not real. People are always trying to make it happen, but they can't. It's called the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist. The spirit of the age, they always try to make it happen. The free spirit, this spirit, that spirit. These things are not new. This phenomena is not at all new. The real Holy Spirit the sevenfold spirit, as he is described in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, and as we see him repeatedly in the book of Revelation and in Ezekiel, he can't be replicated. He can't be duplicated. He can only be mimicked, aped, counterfeited. But they can't deliver the goods. 
They can try and try, but they can't do it. What happens in a situation where the zeitgeist, the spirit of that age, the pagan beliefs, the pagan religions, the mentality of the cults begins to get in among God's people? And God's people think they have the rainbow, but all they have is a man-made spectrum. If you've got the gear, if you have a prism, you can make it look like a rainbow, but it's not a rainbow. A rainbow has to come down from above. They've got all the gear. Last night somebody sent me a, a video clip of a church in Kansas City where it was a rock concert and people, young people were jumping up and down to what was looked to me like second-rate rock music, second-rate entertainment. It was not even good rock music, in my own opinion, having come from the generation that was the generation of rock music. It was cheap, low-grade people who couldn't get a secular record contract, so they're going to use their lack of talent for Christ. That's what most Christian rock is. People who couldn't make it in the secular world, in the secular music industry, so they're going to use their inability for the Lord. That's what it is. And it was just low-grade entertainment. But it was not biblical worship. It was just hype. It was just nonsense. They can't make that rainbow appear. They can't do it. Well, again, not a new problem. Look with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He begins talking about charisms, spiritual gifts. I do not want you to be unaware about spiritual gifts. Now notice the word here is charisms, gifts. Nobody has the gift of tongues. You have the grace to pray in tongues. It, it's real. But nobody has the gift of tongues. Nobody has the gift of prophecy. Nobody has the gift of miracles. Nobody has the gift of the word of knowledge. You have the grace. You have the grace, the charism. The gift is always to the church, not to the individual. By the grace of God, it may operate through an individual, but it's never to an individual. The gifts of God, be they ministry gifts like teaching or evangelism, or be they charismatic gifts like tongues and prophecy, they are never given to a person. They're always given to the body through a person who by the grace of God is called to be God's avenue to deliver the goods. That's all. Jacob Prash does not have the gift of teaching. The body of Christ has the gift of teaching. By the grace of God, the ministry of teaching may operate through Jacob Prash, but Jacob Prash does not per se have the gift of teaching. Neither does Jacob Prash. When he goes in his prayer closet, he may pray in tongues, but he does not have the gift of tongues. He has the grace to pray in tongues. The gifts are never given to a person. If you want the gift, the gift of God, different words in Greek, dorea, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of the Spirit is singular. It's the Spirit himself. Nobody has any of these gifts. The Corinthians were making the problem big the same way they do now. I have the gift of tongue. They have the gift of practice. I believe I have the fivefold ministry. Hallelujah. That was a problem then. That was a problem now. Things sure haven't changed. But then he prefaces his presentation and his didaskin, his instruction, by saying, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. Now what you see in verse 4 and 5 is something you see in Ephesians. The relationship between a charismatic gifting and a ministry, or in Ephesians, a charismatic gifting and a calling. Someone's charismatic gifts are given to equip them to fulfill their calling or their ministry within the body. For instance, a pastor is called, know well the condition of your flocks. To be a pastor, a pastor may have the gift of the word of knowledge. God may simply by the Holy Spirit show that pastor someone in his congregation is going through some kind of a problem or there's some kind of a sin in that person's life or something like this and the Holy Spirit will reveal it to that pastor. Pastors pray for the sick. It is not uncommon, particularly in the third world, 
or a pastor to have a gift of healing. Okay, it may, it may be. It just equips you to do what it is. There are some places when you're up against witch doctors and things like this, and, and sangormas and things like this, where somebody who's an evangelist in that climate may actually have the gift of miracles. Somebody's charismatic gifts equip them for their ministry. One of the ways you find out what ministry you have is to know what charismatic gifts you have, and one of the ways you understand what charismatic gifts you have is understand what your ministry is. It's one of the ways. But then there's the third term. It's not gift. It's not ministry. It is there are a variety of effects in their gamay, but the same God who works all things and all persons. This is like the sevenfold wisdom, uh, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord, godliness. Here was the problem in Corinth. Corinth was a city that was a stone's throw from a place called Delphi. Delphi. Delphi was the temple of the Delphic Oracle. You can still go there. It's excavated somewhat. You can still see where the sulfur pits are. And from these sulfur pits, you have a semi-continual emission of sulfuric gases from these tar pits. They were, are, a hallucinogen. They, when inhaled, affect metabolism, affect the brain, and they cause people to become delirious. They're noxious fumes. Much like sniffing toluene today, like the, 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 these people will sniff glue to get vision. This is a psychedelic experience. They were having a psychedelic experience. The Greek word is pharmakia. It's a kind of sorcery. It's where you use chemical means to induce an occult or mystical experience. And through pharmakia, through the agency of pharmakia, she would go there and she would inhale these fumes. She would sit, sit on top of it and, and inhale these fumes and begin to hallucinate. And stoned out of her mind and whatever and seeing these things, she would begin to engage in automatic ecstatic speech, singing and yodeling and saying things that didn't make any sense. But then you had the priests of Delphi who were interpreting what she was saying, which they took as messages from their gods. So what you had was a counterfeit of the gift of tongues, a counterfeit of the gift of prophecy, a counterfeit of the gift of interpretation of tongues. Straight down the road in Corinth, People who were saved out of this stuff, in verse 2, took that baggage with them into the church. And they began to understand or misunderstand biblical Christianity influenced by their pagan backgrounds. They didn't understand this. Some of you are African. Do witch doctors and sagormas speak in tongues? Every one of them. Every one of them. I've never met a witch doctor who doesn't. They all do, don't they? Of course they do. Do Mormons have tongues? Yes. Do charismatic Catholics pray in tongues to Mary? Of course. Do spiritists have tongues? Yes. Tongues can be demonic. Tongues can be purely psychological, contrived. People think it's real, but it's just ecstatic speech. It can be fabricated. There's actually places that have given people lessons. Just move your lips like this and say whatever it comes into you. <laughs> It can be some combination of those things. Or it can be an authentic gift of the Holy Spirit. Satan only counterfeits things worth counterfeiting. The problem they had in Corinth is the problem we have today. There seemed to be more of the counterfeit than there was the real thing. Most of what was going on was gibberish. Nonsense. Influenced by the popular culture. The spirit of that age. The zeitgeist. In Israel... The Jewish believers and the faithful Jews of Old Testament of Israel always held Mount Zion in contrast to the Bimaot, the pagan high places. Now in Greece, it was Mount Zion up against Mount Olympus, where they believed Zeus was. And these pagan ideas about Christianity got into the church. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ is God who becomes a man. He's 100% human and 100% divine. He's the Son of God. To the Corinthians, Zeus, who was identified with the planet Jupiter, was the corruption of Theos, God. He was the big wheel God, the number one God. Zeus had relations with the human woman and gave birth to a son named Hercules, who was a superhuman man, a supernaturally empowered man who was a savior figure in Greek mythology. He was their savior, Hercules. 
Only he was 50-50. <laughs> he was half human and half divine. The Greeks had anthropomorphic gods. Hercules was 50-50. Jesus was 100 and 100. He was 100% God and 100% man. But you see, when they're looking at Jesus, it's very easy to confuse the Greek concept with the Christian concept. You know, when you were pagans, you were led astray to the dumb idols, however you were led. Now Paul is warning the Corinthians about sexual immorality. The Jews had this concept of Israel as God's woman from the Song of Solomon. The believers had this concept of the church as the bride of Christ from Ephesians. But the Greeks... They had the Parthenon, and they had Athena, and they had gods having relations with human women and all this kind of stuff. This crazy pagan stuff. This idea of sexual union with their deities. This began to creep into the church. You had in the pagan culture the, the Hieros Delphos and the Hieros Gamos, the temple prostitutes and the temple brethren. And they were so much into the dualism, they would, the Greeks were dualists. <laughs> Everything physical is bad, everything spiritual is good in their thinking. So they would think, well, I'm a new creation. The flesh doesn't matter, the flesh profits nothing. It doesn't matter if I go out and, and fornicate or commit adultery or get involved with temple prostitutes. That's only the old creation. The new one can't sin. That's how they were beginning to live. They had this idea that they only had to be Christians in church. When they walked out the door, they lived the same as they lived when they were pagans. And there are people among us today, in this church and others, Christians in church. But when they're out there in the 9 to 5 world, they live the same way as they did before they became Christians. Not a new problem. This kind of problem has always been around. It affected ministry. It affected marriage. It affected morality. It affected everything. That's just the way that they thought about this stuff. The zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, got in among God's people. And they began to think the same as the world. They began to think the same as what they came out of. There seemed to be so much common ground between what was going on in Corinth, and Corinth was a very immoral city, it was the Las Vegas of its day, the Romans adopted gladiator fights from Corinth. It was a really bad place. It was <laughs> the home of moral debauchery, more than any other city in the Roman Empire at that time. Quite a thing. They were just mixing the pagan with the biblical. This happened when, with the tongues, it happened with their view of prophecy, it happened with their view of miracles, it happened with everything. That's just the way that it was with them. And they all thought it was the Spirit. The Spirit. Always in the name of the Spirit. It's always been interesting to me that the church that God had to remind them most about the Holy Spirit was not the confused Thessalonians. It was not the legalistic Galatians. The church that God had to remind them most about the Holy Spirit was the very charismatic Corinthians. The ones who were on about the Holy Spirit the most understood Him the least what the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit really is and what he really does was just so easily counterfeited and wrapped up in the popular culture. Just look. There was a book written in Korea by Young E. Chow called The Fourth Dimension. This is what he wrote. I'm only quoting him. He said, your subconscious imagination is your spirit. No, it isn't. The imagination is a function of the soul, not of the spirit. The spirit is as different from the soul as the soul is from the body. Emotions are not your eyelashes, and uh, your spirit is not your emotions. We're three tripartite, not bipartite. But Eastern religion and Western psychology make us two-dimensional. To Western psychology, we're simply, again, apes with better DNA. We're two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. Biblically, we're three-dimensional. Western psychology says we're two-dimensional. So does Eastern religion. They confuse the soul and the spirit. Actually, Carl Jung, the Western psychologist, believed there was a spiritual nature of man, but he called it the collective unconscious. He mixed it up with the soul. This is the presupposition of these guys, like uh, Maslow and, and Freud and these guys. What they're really practicing is a cult. A cult. Hypnosis is a cult mesmero in Greek. We literally put the evil eye on somebody. Psychology is pseudoscience. It has no quantitative basis. 
It's not like psychiatric medicine or neuropsychology or biopsychology. It's, it has no physiological basis. God breathed on Adam and Adam became a living soul. What people are psychologically is a homogeneous hybrid of what they are spiritually and what they are organically. Mental illness never comes from the mind. If somebody's off their rocker, there's either something wrong with them chemically or something wrong with them spiritually or both. The mental illness doesn't come from the mind. Psychology is a fraud. It's a lie. That's Western psychology. Eastern religion is the same. This guy, Yang Yi Chao, he impresses people in the West because he has a big church. If you go to Asia, you'll find far bigger visualization cults than his. <laughs> far bigger. I remember once I was in Singapore, there was a statue of a Buddha on a street corner, and the people were paying money and getting sticks of incense and visualizing what they wanted to walk around the Buddha. So, Mr. Chow says, your subconscious imagination is your spirit. You visualize what you want. And then he borrowed the Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland word faith formula, and you speak it into being, <laughs> to being by faith. If you want a bicycle, picture it, it's a red bicycle. You want a husband, you want him blonde, you want to... <laughs> You picture, you visualize it, you speak it. Then he says in the book, he says, Hindus and Buddhists have known this for centuries, he says. Now Jesus Christ has shown it to him. I'm not that man's judge. I'm only judging his doctrine. I have no doubt, I have no, I, I have no idea, let's say I have no idea whether that man's a Christian or not. I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he's a Buddhist. He's teaching Oriental shamanism. And of course, people in the West get the book. This goes back to Corinth. Only God can make the rainbow. You can give up all the formulas of visualization you want. There was a book that was popular about 20 years ago in Britain, and I'm only, again, I'm only telling you what they write. There's a, by a woman called, called Joyce Huggett. And she was teaching yoga breathing exercises for Christian prayer, and to use the uh, exercises of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, whose father was murdered tens of thousands of born-again Christians after the Reformation, as a model for Christian prayer. This was picked up by another guy called Richard Foster, who wrote a book, The Celebration of Discipline, using Ignatius Loyola. They're teaching Roman Catholic mysticism, teaching yoga. Now today, the emergent church calls it contemplative prayer. What is it? It's new age. That's all it is. Where does it come from? Corinth. It's not new. You can have the symbol, you can have the rainbow. <laughs> but it's not a real one. You can get a prism and make a spectrum. But you can't put it up in the sky. Only God can. This was the problem in Corinth. It's the problem today. They're always trying to make the rainbow happen. The same as the New Ages. Now it's the emergent church. They're mixing the pagan ideas with the biblical. Some of you know Tom Chaco. Tom Chaco will show you DVDs and videos of people in India having the Toronto experience. Only they call it something different. They call it Kundalini Yoga. It's the exact same thing. But now it's come in to the Western Church. Where did this begin? Toronto? No. Began in Corinth. Began in Babylon. Began in hell. Only God can make a rainbow. The priests of Baal tried to pr make it rain, but it didn't rain, so there was no rainbow. It just didn't happen. It doesn't matter what they say or what they do, now they're all going to some lunatic asylum with a cross on the roof in Alabama. That's the next mecca, to try to get a rainbow. They're not going to get any rainbow. No way. You can do everything. Oh, through technological means, you can produce the spectrum. <laughs> But you can't put that spectrum with light refraction up in the clouds. Only God can. People have tried all kinds of things like cloud seeding. Meteorologists have tried to make it rain. They've tried all kinds of things, but they can't get it to work somehow. They can't do that. No, well, the apostles fasted and prayed for the day of Pentecost. Then the spirit was outpoured. It rained. Elijah was a man who could make it rain. But he had to go up against that pagan stuff. Remember, the priests of Baal, they were not from a heathen nation. They were backslidden Jews. They were Jews who incorporated paganism into Judaism. And today we have the same thing. The emergent church are people incorporating paganism into Christianity. The ecumenical movement are people incorporating paganism into Christianity. 
Most of the charismatic movement is taken over by people who, in their ignorance, are incorporating paganistic beliefs into Christianity, trying to have the rainbow. Quite a thing. I warn about this every so often. I don't like to go on about it all the time, but it's becoming a problem yet again. You see, people are very good at throwing out the baby with the proverbial bathwater. Paul goes on in the same epistle, realizing that was going to happen, and he said, despise not prophetic utterance, forbid not to speak in tongues. In a church like this, with its present leadership, with people like Andy and Tony and the kind of people who were invited to speak here, I can't see this church going into make-believe rainbows. I can't see this church being subverted by New Age beliefs. I can't see this church being spiritually seduced by unscriptural doctrines that really have more to do with Eastern religion. As Isaiah warned, chapter 2 in Isaiah, my people are filled with influences from the East. I can't see that happening here. But what I can see happening here is a reaction to it where we become so afraid of the counterfeit, we shy away from the real. Where the Holy Spirit becomes suppressed. That mentality which says, because there are counterfeiters who counterfeit money, pull your 10 and 20 pound notes out of your pocket and put a match to it. Ridiculous proposition, but churches who go into cessationism do the same thing. They become so afraid of a counterfeit that they no longer are interested in the real. Just like the hyper-charismatics. They talk about the Holy Spirit, but he becomes suppressed. Wisdom. Understanding, might, knowledge, counsel, godliness, fear of the Lord. If the sevenfold spirit is an operation, the rainbow will appear. If the sevenfold spirit is an operation, you'll know it. It's going to rain. The spirit will be outpoured. Unsaved people will be convicted. You'll at least see some growth even in a hardened area, in a hardened time. If the real spirit is there. If the rainbow has indeed appeared, it attracts people to Jesus. If it's really there. But too often the Holy Spirit is suppressed. Those people who forbid to speak in tongues, even though the Bible says don't do it, are just as crazy on one extreme as those hyper-charismatic lunatics are on the other. Those people who despise prophetic utterance are just as off-beam and off-balance on one extreme as those deceivers from Kansas City are on the other. The solution in dealing with the counterfeit of the rainbow is not to have no rainbow. (laughs) The solution is to have the real rainbow. We cannot produce the rainbow. All we can do is ask the Lord to send the rain. His rainbow is real. His rainbow is beautiful. His rainbow is sevenfold. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord, godliness, his rainbow. His rainbow does not come from counterfeit revivals. His rainbow does not come from spraying the hose in the garden. His rainbow comes from Revelation chapter 4. His rainbow comes from one place and one place only. His rainbow comes from the throne of God. Let us not be the kind of people the Corinthians were. But at the same time, let us not become the kind of people Paul warns the Corinthians had the potential to become. Throughout its history, the church has had a propensity to correct error with error. It's had a propensity to correct error with error. We had the Lord's Supper. This church has a Hebraic understanding of the Lord's Supper, Zotasul Zikroni. It comes from the Passover. You understand it as Paschal. Understand this. Because of the idolatry of transubstantiation and the demonic lie of the Mass, there are Christians who only take the Lord's Supper once a year or once a quarter. <laughs> what did they do? In order to avoid that, they correct error with error. Because of Mariolatry, which is the theological term, is hyperdulia, that's what the Catholics call The place of Mary becomes downplayed in evangelical theology because we don't want to be like them. 
In the early church, there was a council called Chalcedon, or Chalcedon. Different people pronounce it differently. And they were reacting against heretics. It's impossible to overstate the deity of Christ. God is God. You can't overstate his deity. But you can understate his humanity. There were people in the early church who were denying the deity of Christ. So they had a council to deal with this, these issues like docetism and things like this. <laughs> Jesus was God. Jesus could have walked on the water because he was God, but he didn't. He did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus could have fed the 5,000 because he was God, but he didn't. He did it by the power of the Spirit. His Father did it through him. Jesus never once used divine power. When Satan tempted Jesus, Satan was tempting Jesus to use his divine power out of concert with the Father. He never did. He never used his divine power even once. In Philippians chapter 1, we're told he took the form of a servant. He became like us. He said that we couldn't equate equality with God, a thing we could grasp. He never used his divine power. So people again saying, oh, well, he's, you know, he's not really God. So what happens? They downplay the Holy Spirit. <laughs> they wind up with something Benetarian. Everything becomes the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is put out of the equation. You know, they correct it error with error. That's what the church always does. Today, there are people who correct error with error. If you look at some of the most dangerous lunatics who've run the church in this country into the ground, the people in the Restoration Movement, almost every one of them came from a strict brethren background. All that good Bible teaching the brethren had, but the Holy Spirit was suppressed. So what did they do? They went to the opposite extreme. Once they get baptized in the Holy Spirit, they go ballistic. They go crazy with it. They corrected error with error. Terrible. Where does Scripture ever correct error with error? Never. God always corrects error with truth. Throwing the baby out with the proverbial bath water has never solved a single problem, and it never will. I love rainbows. I want to see a real rainbow. I don't want to see a New Age symbol painted on a wall. I want to be open to the gifts of the Spirit when the Spirit of God operates that way. If there's a real prophecy, I want to hear it. If there's a real interpretation of a tongue, I want to listen carefully. If there's an authentic healing, I want to give the glory to God. I want the real thing. I really do. I want the real gifts. More importantly, I want the real fruit. I want the real spirit. The real rainbow. The sevenfold spirit of God. Revelation 4. People can't produce it. Nothing we can do is going to make it happen except seek the Lord in prayer. If he shows us to repent, we need to repent. If he shows us to put things right, we need to put things right. But there's nothing you or I are ever going to be able to do to put a rainbow in that sky. God can, and God will. I love rainbows. God bless.